Okay, so maybe we should start huh? the session we have right now. It's actually one of the sessions I'm really looking forward that it's, no, how to use core to teach uh, minimum wage. So I think it's, no, we have high expectations. Uh, and let me also uh, take the opportunity uh, to thank all the whole core team uh, for, for the opportunity to, for, to be here and to collaborate on this uh, project that I think it's, it's gonna, uh, and it's gonna make a difference. So the first uh, speaker uh, we have uh, today is, is, is Sam, who will uh, talk uh, about this, uh, how to use core to teach the minimum wage. Uh, you can go uh, through Maybe I can. No, 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 you have to go, just go the other way. Uh, thanks, thanks, everybody. Um, what I'm presenting here is some notes that Wendy and I worked up uh, because people asked us, you know, well, it's a big question, the minimum wage, and what can we say about that? Uh, these are not intended as uh, notes for teaching, actually, use in the classroom, although some of them could be, but rather to explain to us how our model uh, works. Uh, now, there are, there are a number of um, uh, uh, helps in this. Uh, uh, there, there are a set of um, videos, actually slide walkthroughs uh, by David Klingingsmith uh, on the uh, labor discipline model and on actually many other things are very, very useful. Uh, I think, as you know, the, uh, the minimum wage and particularly the so-called efficiency wage or labor discipline model uh, have been jointly very much in the research literature. It's a very active field now uh, with very interesting evidence uh, for, let's say, uh, effort effects by of the minimum wage and also monopsony effects and so on. Uh, there is, of course, uh, the standard treatment is this, probably at le the, the only thing that could possibly be more frequent as a policy application in your standard textbook is rent control. But if it's not rent control, it's got to be the minimum wage. It's obviously a dumb policy. It reduces employment and uh, so on. Now, um, my colleague Aaron Dubay at the University of Massachusetts and a, a contributor to our work on the labor market uh, model, uh, this is his video, which is part of our, uh, our unit on inequality. He and co-authors uh, have done a number of studies. I just have this, lo this lovely map. These are adjacent counties in the US in which one had a minimum wage and one didn't, or a minimum wage change, and so on. This is a fabulous study. It's also, this is very good for teaching, just because visually it, get, it allows you to teach what a diff and diff estimator is without actually getting very complicated. Because they can see, oh, well, here, here are all these districts in New Mexico, and so on. Uh, <coughs> Now, uh, so uh, this has been going on for 30 years. I mean, I think people now understand there's something wrong with this because this evidence has really piled up. And I don't mean to exaggerate. It's not that there's no effect of the minimum wage. Many studies show no effect, but the effects are certainly very small and much smaller than anyone uh, would have uh, anticipated. Um, now, we don't use that model, the students. I mean, I think, um, I don't know if Wendy mentioned, when, when Paul Samuelson in 1948 said, uh, this is all there is that remains to be said about the supply and demand uh, a doctrine, uh, and it only remains to say when it could be applied and when not, when he said not is that. That is, Samuelson said, don't apply this to the, uh, uh, to the labor market. Uh, of course, uh, those who followed Samuelson, including Samuelson's later editions, didn't follow that, uh, that advice. Uh, but our students will never see this, uh, and our students, if they've learned well, will never talk about the market clearing wage. There is no such thing, uh, and so on. Indeed, some professors talk about efficiency wage theory as explaining why the wage is above the market clearing wage, which is an idiotic statement, because there is no market clearing wage in the model they're describing. Um, now, obviously, we don't use this model be conceptually because the complete contracts on which that model works are absent in labor markets. And there's an empirical reason as well, which is that even in the absence of minimum wages and in the absence of labor market rigidities, for example, in secondary labor markets, we observe substantial amounts of unemployment, uh, typically over long periods, long enough to say it's probably an equilibrium, uh, an equilibrium uh, that, we're, that we're talking about. Um, now, uh, what I want to do here is to, is to suggest uh, a way that the core approach to the labor market can be extended so that in a single model, uh, 
we can embody and, and study the two mechanisms which have been proposed for why it is that the raise in the minimum wage has had such small effects or maybe even no effects on employment. So this is a proposed explanation. And the, the, the thing that Wendy and I are attempting here is to do this in a single model so that we don't have to have ad, ad hoc um, models. We're not against using models for particular purposes, but uh, I think we still confess to liking a general model that can handle both aspects of this problem. Now, one aspect is obviously that the minimum wage should have a, a positive effort effect. And that's what one of those papers that I had on the screen showed, that it, yes, indeed, it does have a positive effort effect. That could be part of the reason, but for reasons which will become clear to you right away if they're not already, this isn't sufficient to explain uh, why there would be no effect. Uh, and the second is that the firm's monopsony power uh, in, the, in the labor market um, it means that it's obviously facing a rising average cost of labor curve. Uh, and these are the two reasons why, and I'll explain how each of them work, uh, the minimum wages uh, could possibly have a limited effect or possibly even a positive effect. The, um, um, so we first have to think, well, why, why would the average cost of labor rise? Uh, that's what the monop monopsonistic firm is facing. Um, now, um, I'll get to the explanation, but the background is that there are two key ideas here. Uh, and the first, basic to any modern model of the labor market, is that uh, simply showing up is not going to make profits for the employer. That's not sufficient. The worker has to do something that cannot be contracted for in order for profits to happen. And the two examples that I give are has to work hard, has to not leave the firm. But I could extend that to quite a few other things that also cannot be contracted for. Um, now, this being the case, the incompleteness of the contract, uh, the firm can benefit by offering the, the worker a wage higher than her next best alternative. And uh, there are two variants of this story here. The one, one is called the worker retention variant. And in this variant, what the worker is, uh, uh, may or may not provide that cannot be secured by contract is retention, that is staying with the firm. Uh, so uh, this, this view of the matter says, well, suppose the worker's effort level is fixed somehow. The models don't really say how, but just suppose it was. They, the employer would still have the problem. The individual may leave imposing costs on the firm. Uh, so that's this, uh, so the, the firm has to pay a wage higher than her next best alternative so that she won't leave, or alternatively, so that more people will show up. There are variants of that. The labor effort variant is more obvious, which is the, here the workers uh, don't quit, uh, but they also need not work unless they're induced to do so by a wage higher than the reservation option. So these are the two things I want to study. As I say, there are other variants we, we could include. Um, now, let's look at the mechanisms underlying why these things give rise to a rising cost of labor. Uh, when we have the, the, the problem of worker retention, that's here, this grayed out thing. You already saw that. Um, now, uh, one way to generate a rising average cost of labor function is, is simple. That is, suppose that quits are proportional to firm size and arrivals are not. Well, it, then in order to render some level of the firm's high, uh, employment stationary, uh, you have to pay higher wages for a larger uh, level of employment. And the reason for that is the larger the firm, the more quits you have, but the more arrivals you don't have. So as you get bigger, you have to pay higher wages to either get more arrivals or to deter quits. Uh, so the wage rate that equates hires to quits, uh, which is a condition for the stationarity of the level of the firm's employment, uh, that rises the larger is the firm. Uh, so that's the worker retention problem, and that'll give you a rising average cost of labor function. Uh, now, the mechanism for labor effort uh, is quite different, and it's the following. Uh, it does, this doesn't require a company town, but it may help you visually to imagine a company town. Uh, and one or two firms are hiring people there. As the firm hires more, the unemployment pool shrinks. And as the unemployment pool shrinks, the probability of escape from unemployment also falls. And therefore, the worker's fallback option improves because if he or she is unemployed, she'll remain unemployed for a shorter period of time. So the firm itself is actually, uh, by hiring more, 
improving the fallback position of the worker. Now, in a standard model, standard labor discipline model or principal agent model, we just assume the fallback is exogenous. But obviously, in many actual labor markets, that's not the case. Some firms are large enough so that their hiring actually does affect the size of the, uh, of the unemployment pool. Uh, so those are the two. I mean, I haven't said anything yet about the minimum wages. I'm just trying to motivate the idea that, yes, indeed, that average cost of labor function could be upward rising. Uh, now, um, Wendy and I, in, in writing these notes, decided we would focus on the labor effort variant of this uh, uh, after quite a bit of discussion with Suresh Naidu and Aaron Dubé and others. I'll come back to their uh, contributions in a bit. Um, the labor discipline model, which is the basis for this effort story, is fundamental to the way CORE teaches not only about the labor market, but about society. And it's, I mean, we have a lot of points which we want to get across. When, when contracts are incomplete, the exercise of power and social norms are an important part of the way contracts are actually executed. And that's part of this story. I mean, it's, it's a, it isn't something that you just add to it. It's an integral part of it. And that's a good reason to use this as a way, of, as our standard model. Uh, it, but it also allows, uh, in a single model, rather than in two separate models, to study the effort uh, effects and the monopsony effects. So that's basically the reason why we do this. Um, by the way, uh, fr from, from here on, there'll be some te technical stuff. Uh, so please ask me questions. Uh, uh, as, as I said, these are really notes to instructors. They're not, um, I don't propose to teach this to students quite yet. So do ask me questions, because if it's unclear to you, then it's not doing its purpose, which is we're trying to sort of figure out together how, how that we should think about it, and then maybe go on and provide some teaching slides uh, later. Um, uh, now, um, uh, this is the, uh, the key idea which you heard. The monopsonistic firm hires more labor. It raises the fallback position. Uh, and um, that, that means that it increases the wage that the firm has to set to deter shirking. So now I've, I've taken a step further, notice. I'm now saying I'm going to use a no shirking model. And I'm going to say, what is the, minimum, the least wage the firm has to pay? Uh, in order to deter shirking by the workers. And I'm telling you that that's going to rise the more the firm hires, because obviously the, least, the less bad is being unemployed under those circumstances. Uh, this being the case, uh, the, average, the average cost of labor, which is just the no shirking wage, the wage sufficient to deter shirking, is going to be increasing in the level of hiring. And that, that gives you your rising average cost of labor curve. The average cost of labor rising is critical because if the average cost is rising, obviously the marginal cost is higher. And that's going to be critical in why the minimum wage could actually increase the amount of employment. So this is the key idea that because I mean, the, the marginal cost of hiring, a non-shirking worker exceeds the average cost. Uh, now, um, so this is an empirically estimated wage curve from the United States for the whole economy. And our thought is that we would, uh, this is, uh, a, uh, if you do it analytically, which is the next couple of slides, I'll show you that you get exactly a function looking like this. So the empirical data and the theoretically derived uh, um, uh, object look very similar. So our idea is to say, OK, suppose the firm is facing a function like this. This is their average cost of labor. Then uh, how would a minimum wage impact them? Uh, the, um, uh, you might, I mean, uh, another way to look at this instead of company town would be, suppose all the employers in the economy were a cartel with respect to hiring. Uh, then what would they think of when they're hiring? Well, they surely would think of, if they hire more, the pool of unemployment is going to be smaller, because that's, that, that's unavoidable if, the, if all of the employers in the economy are doing this. So either a cartel or a large firm in a small labor market, that's, that's good enough. Um, now, the, um, there, there are two results in this model. Uh, the, the first result is that by imposing a, a wage on the firm, you no longer have the distinction between the marginal and average cost. The minimum wage is both the marginal and average cost over the, the range of employment for which it's binding. So 
We used to have the marginal cost higher than the average cost. We obliterate that by imposing a minimum wage in which marginal equals average cost equals the minimum wage. Uh, that's this here. So uh, essentially, the minimum wage converts the firm to being a wage taker instead of a wage maker. Now let's think about the monopsony logic. Uh, you know the, the monopoly firm uh, balances selling more against the reduction in price associated with selling more because of the downward sloping demand curve. The logic for the monopsony firm is exactly the same. It doesn't hire as many as it would because uh, obviously it's not facing a fixed wage, but it's facing a wage which rises in its employment level. So the minimum wage basically obliterates the monopsony effect over the range in which it's effective where the minimum wage uh, is um, lower than the marginal cost of hiring effort. Uh, so that's that effect. And I'll show you a picture of that, by the way. Um, uh, and the second effect is um, the firm faced with a minimum wage, which is binding, if it's a profit-maximizing firm, it's kind of stuck. It's now paying more than it should be to deter people from working. What should it do? Well, we'll come to that in a second, but I think you can figure out that they should adjust upwards the level of effort which they are requiring to not get fired as a worker. Uh, so that, that will give you an effort increase. Um, now, as I, uh, I've mentioned or hinted a number of times, there are, there are all kinds of generalizations of a model like this. Strike, uh, you know, there's retention, there's strike avoidance, there's an, and a whole lot of other uh, uh, ideas in the literature which are consistent with this. But let's, um, let's illustrate this, the first one, by calibrating a model. And what I do is I just, I, I assume a production function, a demand function, and so on. I actually am going to have to introduce, uh, Wendy, close your ears, the uh, uh, marginal revenue function, which <laughs> Wendy has imposed a heavy tax on, but never, <laughs> never mind. We're, we're going to have a, we, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, well, I, you know, I'm old enough, so I'm kind of used to it by now. <laughs> so, so, okay, Wendy, here it is, sorry. Uh, so uh, the, this is the marginal revenue function. It's just based on a production function of effort. Uh, this is the uh, number of workers hired. Uh, the blue line is the cost of hiring a non-shirking worker. So the blue line is, is the non-shirking condition. Now, with uh, uh, the non-shirking wage rate is endogenous with respect to employment because as you hire more, the workers fall back position increases. And, uh, and the black line is the marginal cost of hiring a non-shirking worker. And so, uh, the, the first order condition is the marginal revenue product equal the marginal cost of hiring. And that gives us this point here. The firm hires 72% uh, of the mar labor market. Uh, impo imposing the same first order condition, but now with a minimum wage of this level here, which is five, I guess, uh, in which the marginal cost of hiring, can you trace it out in your mind? The marginal cost of hiring is this. Uh, and uh, up to here and then up to some high level. Uh, it jumps up, it's discontinuous. So the firm uh, now will equate the marginal revenue product of uh, uh, workers with their marginal cost and higher 0.8. Uh, now, by the way, you, you've probably all seen this or thought about it and so on. By the way, this is very teachable. Uh, if you teach anything about factor hiring under monopsony, you can easily teach this. And students find it pretty exciting. Oh my god, it's, I mean, how many really counterintuitive things do we teach our students? You know, maybe comparative advantage is one of them, or at least people say it's counterintuitive. Uh, but this, um, so, this gives us the effect of the minimum wage. Uh, uh, it, uh, so, um, uh, Remember, the, the, this is the monopsony effect. I, now I want, to include, I, I want to turn to the second effect, uh, which is the effect on um, effort. Uh, uh, in, in the notes that Wendy and I have written, uh, we apply exactly the same model to the earned income tax credit, the EITC. Uh, and we explore whether or not they're complements or substitutes and so on. It's, it's easy to do. It applies exactly the same calibration and so on. So it's just, it, again, it's a teaching. If you wanted to spend an entire lesson uh, teaching this and sort of showing that the model can do something fun, uh, if you have good students, maybe it's worth doing. 
Okay, increased effort. Uh, it, before the minimum wage was imposed, the firm was paying the least wage consistent with the workers working at whatever level of employment the firm was engaged in. And so it was uh, paying this wage, uh, that's the non-shirking wage, and that's the effort level, E bar, that the firm is requiring workers to work so as to avoid being fired, and they're all working at that level. Um, now, the firm is now required to pay some wage higher than this, and, uh, and of course, the HR department tells the owners, we're throwing away money, we're paying workers more than we have to to get them to work at E bar. And so what should the firm do? I think I can show you. Let's see if this works. Let's see what we got. No, wait. <laughs> wait. We're ready. No, no, wait. He's, this is, he's in a factory somewhere here. All right, we get the, Charlie, Char Charlie Chaplin's Factory Times. What? I think I got a different one. Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. No, no, here it is. Look at that. Oh. <laughs> Okay. I'm oh, sorry. You, you all remember the scenes, right? <laughs> They're running around the factory. Uh, so, okay. So, um, so what's the answer to this? What's the answer? Yeah, speed up. Right. So basically, that's the that's the idea. Now, uh, the. Okay, uh, so um, uh, to see how that works in, in this model, we have, first have to see how does the firm set the no-shirking uh, um, uh, effort level in the first place. Uh, this is a standard. This comes directly from uh, uh, the core. This looks like the worker's best response function. This is the wage rate. And this is the effort level the worker will uh, do under various wages. Uh, now. That's, I mean, and, and, you know, point A is the first order condition for the worker choosing, uh, for the, for the uh, employer choosing a wage and the worker choosing an effort level. But that's not what's going on here because the, the wage is being set by somebody else. So this is not the worker choosing the effort level. This is the firm choosing the no-shirking level and then deciding what wage to pay as a result of that. So the firm from, this, this is called the solo condition here in, uh, the principal agent model. The firm says, oh, E bar is what I want them to, uh, to work, and uh, therefore I'll pay the no shirking wage W bar. But what if the wage is already given? Well, if the wage is already given, then the firm's problem is, um, the firm's problem is, is, is simple. It no longer jointly chooses the wage and the effort level. It just given the wage, it's going to choose an effort level. Uh, and obviously, uh, it wants to, uh, the firm is going to choose a no shirking effort level given the minimum wage, which is higher than the old wage, and so therefore they can now extract more labor per hour from the worker. Uh, so, that, so the firm is now adjusting upwards its ex expectations from its, uh, from its workers. Important thing to notice about this part of the story, not the monopsony story, is there's no way that the firm could have lower costs after the imposition of the minimum wage. It has to have higher costs. It's being pushed away from its first order condition for profit maximization. So the firm has taken a reduction in profits. Uh, but notice, it can be very small. It can be vanishingly small, depending on what the shape of this uh, uh, best response function is. Uh, if this is not very concave, if you know what I mean, not very kinked, well, then the cost will be very small. Uh, and so the, uh, what, what this says is the cost, the, the offsetting effort effect can be very large, uh, but it can never really offset the minimum wage. Uh, yeah? Um, can we go back one slide, please? Um, in, the, in the core, there is a, another model that has a, 
analogous effect, which is a trade union, mm -hmm. where the wage is imposed you know, by the trade union. And we simply address that by having a um, cost uh, mm -hmm. of effort uh, line that is flatter. Mm -hmm. um, why we are not taking that approach here, or are we taking yeah. it because if I miss something? It's the same. It could, I mean, it, you could represent it in the same way. Okay. Suppose, that, yeah, so, suppose a trade union has imposed a wage uh, and it's higher than what the firm would have offered. Okay. Well, then uh, it, that's just like the monopsony case, and the firm should then increase the effort level unless the trade union has bargained that also. You see yeah, what I'm exactly. saying? If, if they achieve a wage increase, then the obvious thing for the firm to do, if it can get away with it, is compensate by increasing the effort level required to deter shirking. So I think it's exactly the same. Thanks. I hadn't really. Had... In my discussion, can you please ask the same question? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a different answer? It's a slightly different model. Oh, okay. Different context, but <laughs> consistent. Okay. Um, um, okay. This is just to summarize. Uh, the monopsony firm can hire more after the imposition. A binding minimum wage will mean there's an effort uh, increase, which will partially offset the cost of this. Uh, and as I mentioned, we can extend it to the EITC. Now, there are a number of things uh, that I haven't talked about and which are limitations of the model if one wanted to use it for general policy. Uh, one is just a technical point. I chose a production function uh, so that the, um, uh, the effect of the change in effort did not change the marginal revenue product uh, function. Uh, there are two effects that cancel out. In fact, I didn't realize I did that. I just later wondered why it wasn't changing, and it's because I'd chosen a particularly logarithmic function that had that character. And I chose to, to go with that because it's simple, and I didn't want to talk about that effect. Uh, much more important is that you would expect, in the long run, firms to exit or to reduce employment because of the reduced profitability of the firms. And that uh, it's, I mean, it is surprising why we don't observe, in the long run, more effects of the minimum wage, because they should, I mean, they should have a negative effect on profitability in either the monopsony case or in the effort case. Then the effect will be negative. It must be that, at least in the U.S. labor markets that are being studied, those effects are small, and the fraction of minimum wage payments as a fraction of the total wage bill of the firm isn't very large. Uh, uh, proponents, I mean, I've spent a lot of time doing politics, the minimum wage in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and in the state of New Mexico. And I'm constantly uh, burdened by the, uh, my, uh, my comrades in this. They all believe that raising the minimum wage in Santa Fe, by the way, we doubled it in a year. Uh, it went from 450 to 850. That's not quite double, but that was a really an incredible increase. And uh, what was what the people advocating this, trade union churches and so on, with whom I was working, they all believe this is going to increase aggregate demand, and that's why it was going to have a positive effect. And that's the one argument that everybody who loves the minimum wage understands. And it's almost certainly wrong at the level of a city and possibly of a state. Not wrong at the level of a nation, perhaps. I mean, but you know, this, this probably cannot, is not the thing which is uh, accounting for these data. It is the reason, why, by the way, why Samuelson didn't want us to use that, mar that labor market model, because he said, Wages will have effects on the demand for labor. Um, the, um, as you, those of you who, who follow labor economics know that monopsony is the hottest thing in town right now. Um, and uh, some of our colleagues, uh, contributors to CORE, are active in that literature. I've mentioned Suresh Naidu and uh, Aaron Dubey already. Uh, I, I'm not convinced by the studies so far that these monopsony effects account for the stagnant wages in America, for example, since the 70s. I mean, when I say account for, I don't, you know, if somebody said how much of that would be accounted for by the increased monopsony, uh, I have no idea uh, uh, that would require that we know how much the increase in monopsony has been and what these monopsony effects are like. I, I just think we have to be modest in what we can say about that. We just don't know. And until we do know, I think it's a mistake to say that monopsony pr provides a good reason why wages went flat in, at, in, during the 70s. Uh, I draw your attention to this Naidu Dubey memo, uh, which we can circulate. Um, the, uh, it's, it's a market in which there's a single kind of labor. Obviously, we typically think of the minimum wage as being addressed to a particular uh, body of labor that's uh, underpaid, perhaps discriminated against, uh, perhaps disadvantaged in some other way, either politically or in some other way. Uh, and um, 
the, uh, uh, the fact that we can explain why the minimum wage doesn't have the negative effects uh, which are usually attributed to it doesn't mean that the minimum wage is an ideal policy for helping poor people. Uh, it happens to be political gold, at least in America. I mean, people, I've canvassed for the minimum wage. And I, I trained canvassers about all the arguments about you know, this kind of stuff, right? And what I found myself is you knock on the door and say, we'd like you to sign this thing so we can get on the ballot a you know, a cost of living uh, uh, adjustment for the minimum wage or raising a minimum wage. And then the person says, um, oh, by the way, what, what is the minimum wage? And you say, it's, um, it's 850. And they say, 850? God damn it, how do people live on that? They sign your thing and off you go down the street. You never get asked about these things. All they have to know is that people can't live working you know, uh, uh, 1,750 hours a year, which is full time. Uh, you can't live on it, and, and people sign. Uh, it, it combines sort of the, des the deservingness of work with the sort of uh, with the, the fact that it's uh, actually not a very you know I think it's just it the deservingness so it's great politics I don't think it's great economics I think there are better ways to help poor people earn more uh, but uh, but for now like rent control by the way I'm not willing to criticize it uh, uh, until we have a better alt I'm not willing to say we should adopt something else unless I see something else that we will actually do to help uh, people who are less well off. Um, this is a wonderful thing for a flipped classroom because students are really engaged with it and, you can, and they have a lot of, quote, opinions. I believe this, I believe that. It's a wonderful opportunity just to beat that out of them and force them to use the model. Uh, and, uh, or, or to write an op-ed. Uh, uh, or, uh, and um, uh, the, the thing which, which I'm presenting here is what Wendy and I call a teaching note. Uh, we would like to have many more of them. Uh, uh, Wendy has one on the, uh, how the core macro model deals with inflation. These are really written for us, trying to work out things amongst ourselves. Uh, I think Wendy's presentation this afternoon will be sort of of that character. Uh, and we certainly welcome thinking about a bunch of hard things. Uh, <clears throat> modern monopoly, the rent-seeking state. Well, the la labor discipline model, we already have some of that. Uh, obviously, I mean, as you know, we, we, we present the central bank as <coughs> principal and commercial banks as agents. Well, that's an interesting model. It hasn't really been worked out yet, in, at least not to the extent of the credit market model and the labor market model. Uh, a, some teaching notes on bubbles and burst and so on. And that's it. Thank you. And now we'll see if it works, eh? Let's see Here. if it's then seamless. You're going to have to use this for some reason, the pen. I have to get out of this. I will minimize yeah. that. And then yeah. I'll go to here. You say I'm using, I can use this one, you say, or not? Yeah, you can say Fine, it okay, works. fine. Okay, thank you, Sam, um, for that. I just wanted to start with a few observations before going into um, what's on the slide here, just arising out of the, um, some of the discussion we've just, just had, not least Sam's comment about um, Wendy's views on marginal revenue. I c couldn't <laughs> let that go um, unnoticed. So what, what I want to do in this brief discussion um, is make some links from what Sam's been saying in relation to the cause treatment uh, of, of uh, the no shirking condition, labor discipline model, and minimum wages, to relate it mostly to one of the topics and themes which is very important in the early parts of the, the core um, units, which is on, on hours. And there are a number of reasons for that. One of the reasons is that another way in which um, employers uh, can impose uh, their labour market power on workers is not just by pushing down wages, but is by um, pushing up hours. I think also when we talk about minimum wage legislation, it's important to talk about maximum hours legislation. Uh, and I want to, um, to get to that point, if, if possible, in these uh, 10 minutes. Um, what I also want to, to show is one more example in which to the extent that the supply and demand model has 
any purchase. It's a special case, if that, of the way that we might think about how labor markets work. And in doing that, I'll also um, show a diagram in which, at best or at most, the marginal revenue products labor curve is a very special case of the outcomes that we might be considering. So they're either irrelevant or a bizarre special case. So um, on to the material on the slides. So, um, so what's not to like? We all like freedom, economic freedom, social freedom, political freedom. So the language in which uh, we portray the traditional model is one which is, has very heavy overtones about things which it would be hard to disagree with. Is this, is this font size reasonable at the back? Can you, you can just about make that. Um, so the traditional textbook um, model of apparently equally free employers and employees for me, one of the main reasons that I um, welcome so much the whole core project is that it, it locates into our understanding of how economic relationships develop the space and scope for thinking about power, and in particular asymmetric power, which is not a word which is often used in traditional economic analysis. And just as my favorite recent example of asymmetric power is, given that my middle years, of teenage years anyway, were spent in, uh, in North Lincolnshire in England, um, where there is a company town called Scunthorpe. There's another one neighboring it, which was a fish town called Grimsby. These are heavily Brexit voting places. Um, a steel worker in Scunthorpe informs their employer that they're quitting. It's not national news. Um, shares in British Steel do not plummet. British Steel announced, as they did a few weeks ago, that they're closing down production in Scunthorpe and it's national news. The consequences for each worker and the wider community are devastating. And uh, from the Guardian newspaper, uh, is it only a clicker that's going to move this? No, the space bar. Or the oh. Okay. Space bar. Space bar. You're going to get Charlie Chaplin in now. Um, <laughs> I just want to slide too. Um, the arrow key is not working. The down key is not working. The space bar is not working. It sounds a little like something is lost. Oh. Thanks, Wendy. Oh, I had that wrong around, probably. Have I used too many, of course, too many radical terms for the University of no, Warwick's IT system? The marginal revenue product issue. That was the one, did it? <laughs> Do we go out and go in again? Mm -hmm. okay, why don't you go back in? Um, I think it's this file. Let's hope so. No, it's not this. This is an older version of the file. Um, let me just try one more. No, let me just try. I'll just get it on the USB stick if I can find the USB stick. Uh, yeah, look, it'll be easier to use the mouse. There's something wrong with my pad there. Uh, that's this is okay. the mouse. There we go. It's fine. Now, fingers crossed. Yay. Okay. So in case you don't know what Scunthorpe looks like, that's what Scunthorpe looks like. So, from a distance, on a nice evening. Um, so the Guardian reported a few weeks ago, major problems, company town, steelworks closing in Scunthorpe. So what I want to think about is how what Sam's, the framework Sam's presenting um, corrects that whole idea of these free markets with employers as wage takers and provides an analysis of minimum wage legislation in the context of employer power and linking it crucially to the labor discipline model, which is so crucial to, um, to how we do things in, in core. Firms are not facing a faceless, perfectly competitive market wage, wage rate, clearing market wage rate, and the firm restricts hiring to sustain a lower wage. I want to make three remarks in the, in the course of this discussion. The first one is a relatively minor point about the order of the narrative um, Sam, that you, you gave in, in the fuller version of the slides which I saw. Then I want to link it to uh, min maximum hours legislation as treated by core in Unit 5 and time permitting. 
um, I want to say a bit more about employer power, minimum wage legislation in, in the UK. Okay, so I'm going to just shoot through uh, these slides um, to get to the point. So here's, the st here's actually something which in my first year economics module for joint degree students, which is being replaced by core next year after this long, slow burn. Um, this, is, this is essentially the model I've been teaching for the last 15 years or so. Um, so it's very closely related, but without that no shirking condition link into what then in, in our traditional way of teaching has been the macro model. And I just want to think that um, I, I prefer, I, I, the narrative I like best is when we think about that minimum wage coming in, and initially firms, which I think in the longer version, some of what, of what you've, the teaching note that you're developing, is one in which you think about case one as being where the minimum wage is really quite high, and then you consider case two where it's not so high. And I just think that as a narrative format of teaching it, I have found that it's much, better, it's much easier for the students to relate to it if we think about it as increasing in steps to that point. So I simply reverse the case one, case two story that you tell. And that was a, a minor point that I wanted to make. And that's what these slides go through. And, and I can now move on to my second remark. So the second remark is to, to remind us all that hours of work um, are an important part of the units, uh, the first units of, of, of the core economy. That, that unit three in looking at decision making and choices and indifference curves and essentially the antecedents of isoprofit curves are all there in unit three focusing on hours of work outcomes. That builds up into unit five on the um, Bruno with a, as the landowner um, and Angela as the farmer and hours decisions and the various scenarios. And, and I think this is just such a powerful analysis that the core project builds upon because it's able to capture so many different aspects and dimensions of the ways in which outcomes are actually generated in economies. So, in case of font size is not great for the back. Um, so what, what we've got in, this is figure 510 from, from unit 5. So what we've got here is um, Angela's farming the land of Bruno. Um, and there's some feasible frontier. Um, Angela's um, got various, there are various institutional arrangements which determine the nature of this relationship. One of them is a one of pure coercion, that's not shown in this figure, this is, that's shown in, a, in earlier figures in this analysis. This is one where there's voluntary trade and an outcome can be on a contract curve between points C and D. And this model is used um, in figure 10 to demonstrate how by having maximum hours legislation, the Angela's position improves because that shifts her onto a higher indifference curve from her reservation indifference curve to a point like F. And then it makes the really nice point that, however, that's not a Pareto efficient outcome, and they will bargain to somewhere between G and H. So all kinds of things are captured in this analysis. Um, I've summarized some of them here. The analysis is capable of capturing the importance of biology um, in, in the analysis that builds up to this by looking at um, the minimum a biological constraint that would enable Angela to, to produce bushels of grain um, and on which she could be coerced by, by Bruno with a gun to her head. Um, technology in the, style, in the style of the feasibility frontier. Efficient outcomes along contract curves. The equity of outcomes according to where the outcome is along the contract curve. And also those differences between coercion, voluntary trade, and the different institutional arrangements, for example, the implementation of a maximum hours constraint that would mean that um, Angela couldn't be forced to work more than these four hours, but could choose to um, if, if contracting enabled that. So the importance of property rights and legislative protection are all a core part of that. So this is one of my absolute favorite parts of, uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's an example of what I think is so valuable about 
about, about the core and about, outcome, about outcomes that we observe in the real world as, we, as we're able to analyze them in this kind of style are institutionally context dependent um, rather than some, and I got a bit carried away with words the other day, some magical emergence from a mythical arrangement of perfectly competitive free markets in a perpetual state of idealized equilibrium. Finally, remark three. So, so the model, so we've seen two models. We've seen Sam's presentation looking at minimum wage legislation in a core framework. Just seen um, unit five and figure 5.10 and the maximum hours legislation. I want to think about putting those two things together. Um, and so this is, this is, uh, this is the motivation, this is further motivation for doing that in the context of empirical evidence. So there's what I think of as a very important paper by Mark Stewart and Joe Swaffield, published in the EJ in 1997, and then a follow-up paper on minimum wages and uh, the impact on hours of work in an economic paper in 2008. And what, um, what, what the 1997 paper does is to look at hours of work outcomes of British workers and um, establishes a number of facts and then evidence from, from their econometric analysis. So the, the, the main takeaway from the paper is that workers aren't on labor supply curves. Firms aren't on margin revenue product curves. Workers um, aren't on their labor supply curves. So we teach all this stuff in first year economics about indifference curves generating labor supply curves, but it turns out that many workers aren't on their labor supply curves. For me, that underscores yet again that importance of thinking about reservation indifference curves and where workers are pushed to rather than some notion of supply and demand, supply and demand, that's all you need to know, and of free choice. So Mark Stewart, Joe Swaffield, they're finding no free choice of hours within jobs and limited choices across jobs. Job offers, therefore, typically have hours constraints bundled with the wage. Uh, a, huge num a huge proportion of work of Male workers in the UK at that, at that time, and this has not changed, were working off their labor supply curve, working a different number of hours from the hours they were chosen at that wage rate. And the majority of those were working more hours than they would want. Um, minimum hours constraints were often set by firms and found to be an increasing function of local unemployment. And the minimum hours constraint is, tends to be a negative function of the wage. So I'll look at an analysis which brings together I think elements of Sam's analysis with the Angela Bruno context. I'll try and be fairly quick because whoever's chairing the session is probably going to point out to me that I have a maximum hours constraint, minutes constraint. So if we were going to go through it in a class with students, I would build up the analysis as so, but I'm not going to. I'm going to get to this image here. Where? What's happening is... In WH space, wage rate hours space, we can think of workers having indifference curves and firms as having isoprofit curves. If we did believe there was such a thing as a labor supply curve, it would, be the, it would, be, it would go through the minimum points of all the indifference curves. If there were, in an imaginary world, such a thing as a marginal revenue product of hours relationship, then it would just be the locus of points representing the, the, the zeniths, for want of a better expression of the isoprofit curves. A firm with um, dominant employer power over workers in the wage hours contract negotiation or setting would push workers down to a reservation indifference curve um, on, a con on a contract cur curve with the usual tangency relationship with an isoprofit curve. Under most reasonable assumptions about indifference curves and isoprofit curves, we would find that there's a downward sloping, negatively sloped contract curve. The consequence is that in relation to the putative labor supply curve, which for the firm is a marginal cost of hours curve, labor supply curve, then we're going to see that the firm has pushed workers' wages down, very similar to what Sam was saying. We, can relate, we could try and relate this to 
no shirking conditions. I haven't done, done that. But also they're pushing their, work, their hours up. And that goes back to that Swaffield Stewart result that low paid workers are the ones who are working more hours than they would like to. And they're off their labor supply curve, working more hours than they would want to at that wage rate. In fact, in this example, they're, given that wage rate, they'd want that many hours, they're working way more hours. So we'd want to protect these low wage workers with minimum wage legislation. So we bump up the wage. But if we haven't affected in any other way employers' bargaining power and, um, in, in the setting of wages now as contracts, the firm would simply respond by moving the worker at the same reservation indifference curve to here. And we notice that although, well, to here rather, although the wage has increased, workers are now working even more hours than they would want to at that wage rate. Corollary, if the minimum wage legislation is there to protect workers, they need protection from this other dimension of uh, employer uh, labour market power. And so you do that by imposing, um, so that's, that's where it would go to. And you'd, you'd respond to that as a legislator protecting workers by having a maximum hours constraint, which would then bring you back to somewhere like this. That's off the contract curve, so Angela and Bruno would then have the option of renegotiating to move back onto the contract curve. The consequence is that in raising wages, but also restricting hours to a maximum, the con you move the worker up the, and the firm up the contract curve, and a corollary of minimum wage legislation accompanied by maximum hours legislation is that wages rise and hours fall. One of the reasons given in the literature for why minimum wage legislation has not had the adverse effects on unemployment that some people might have expected is because of other forms of adjustment, like effort adjustment that Sam was talking about, but also the evidence from, for example, many papers, but including Stuart and Swaffield 2008 in Economica, is hours adjustment. Firms have reduced hours, and this model is also therefore, is also therefore consistent with that. I'll close at that point. Thank you very much. So we have time for several questions. Yes. Um, hi, I'm uh, Paul Cowell from the University of Stirling. Um, and just as a bit of background, we're hoping to go fully core um, in the next couple of years for our first two years of our undergraduate program. Um, I just want to thank you both for presenting this. It's been really interesting. Um, so I started lecturing a few years ago at the third year level, at the advanced level, undergraduate, and it felt like the Dead Poet Society, where you take the supply and demand and you rip it out of the book. Um, and I started them off with the Shapiro Stiglitz model, which this, you know, being able to see this in the core at a very intuitive way is, um, is really exciting. And of course, it lent itself to a lot more advanced mathematical um, approaches like dynamic programming, things like this, in terms of a, a math supplement. So it's more of a comment, really, to just say it's really exciting, really looking forward to working with it. Great. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Just, just a brief comment. The, where Robin talks about the firms compensating by, make, uh, by uh, extending hours, that's exactly the same as, as Wendy and my response to you about trade union bargaining a higher wage. They could associate a higher wage with a higher level of effort. Uh, and of course, it's much harder to control that. Um, but uh, this model is a little different because notice in this model, the firm is uh, pushing the worker down to their next best alternative. That's, mm -hmm. So in this model, the participation constraint is binding. Uh, so it's not really a principal agent model <coughs> at all, uh, th and uh, so they're 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 just yeah. they're they're using all of their bargaining power to extract everything from the worker. Uh, that's the difference, but it has a common uh, aspect, which is, of course, the firm, if it's forced to to do something suboptimal for it on one front, it'll do something else, and their legislation has to deal with that. And the question we had earlier from our friend over here um, was that. 
Um, there's a paper by Andrew Oswald and I think Alan Carruth who looks at you, your question was in, in concern with, with unions imposing on firms <coughs> some outcome ab above what might be a competitive market outcome. There's, um, there's, a, there's an Oswald Carruth paper from the 80s or 90s which doesn't, en uh, enable, doesn't have the possibility of all this stuff down here but it has it all going on up here and talks about a contract curve between a union and an employer pushing wages up and hours down in, in, in a union firm bargaining mm. um, setting. By the way, the word contract curve is, uh, along with marginal revenue product and probably a whole <laughs> bunch of other words, are heavily oh, no. taxed. And the reason why, the contract curve is, should be called something like the Pareto efficiency locus or something like that. It ver there's all, very often no contract involved. Uh, and so to, to uh, I mean, in a lot of the problems we study, we're just looking at the tangency of two uh, in, in, uh, indifference curves. So we should just get rid of the term contract curve uh, because so many problems, there, are, there is no contract. It's just a Pareto efficiency locus. Can I make a special case for it being in situations where you're talking specifically about a, a contract of an employer offers a worker? That literally is a contract. Yes. In a sense, it makes it apply more you know, linguistically. It really makes us think about that employment contract. But it teaches the students that contracts tend to be efficient. Right, okay. They, I mean, what other, what, right. why else would you call the Pareto efficiency locus a contract curve, mm -hmm. except for ideological reasons? Mm -hmm. Right. Question? So, so this is a, a, first of all, challenge for both of you on the, the marginal revenue <laughs> question. <laughs> That's both of you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you can do monopsony just beautifully with isoprofit curves. You know, right. why yeah. don't you switch? Just isoprofit curves, uh, wage employment space um, is mm -hmm. on the up, mm -hmm. upward sloping part mm -hmm. of the, the, the isoprofit, mm -hmm. or is it up the horizontal, which, mm -hmm. which yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, goes through the marginal? Right. Um, right. product. So, so it's mm -hmm. very easy to do. <laughs> right. yeah. um, and, 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 I, and, you know, because, because there is actually a problem if, if, we're, going, if we're going to teach students um, to use this tool, we, we need to extend it into the other things that we want to do. So, yeah. um, but the second question is something I think maybe I haven't quite understood about uh, uh, fr from, from Sam. Um, if, if, we, if we're going to use the effort model, um, as uh, the basis for an argument about the minimum wage, then we've got a kind of a, a three variable model. We've got wages, employment, and effort. So have you thought about how, uh, um, you know, what, what, what kind of tools we're going to use to get those, th those three kind of margins of adjustment in, into, into, uh, uh, into a, a kind of single conceptual model when we can't just use a two-dimensional diagram? Well, I would trust your judgment on this, Margaret. I mean, Margaret knows about labor markets. Uh, so I'd, I'd really trust your judgment about how to do it. But what I did here is I said, let's deal with the question seriatim. That is, first we look at the monopsony effect as if there is no effort effect, uh, and then that gives you something. And then you look at the effort effect as something added to that. Now, I didn't do that, and I chose a production function in which I didn't have to look at the effort effect on the marginal revenue product curve. Uh, but I, th I think that the, the, the step of, you know, inverting the so-called solo condition and then looking at how the firm's going to choose a new effort level, um, I think, in fact, that could be integrated into the, the standard model. Mm -hmm. and, and I completely agree with you. If we're going to use the isoprofit low side, then we should do it. Um, just bad habits. Yeah. And I didn't know you'd become such a zealot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I convinced myself. <laughs> yeah. But, but don't, don't we also, don't we, this whole idea of the teaching notes, which I, I didn't know that this was in necessarily in that context or that context existed before this, mm. this workshop. So I know from the early days of the discussion of the economy, the next project was not necessarily going to be ESPP or doing economics. It was going to be an intermediate mm. economy. And, but what I like instead is the idea that we've got, as the economy, we've got some which is compared to what I'm familiar with, is hugely demanding technically and um, comprehensively, universally, in, in the knowledge and understanding that students are expected to have at the end of one year of studying economics. It's a hugely ambitious project, which is fine, because it means that in different places people can customise it and use different parts of it. But what it also does is provide lots of feeders which go way beyond what you probably could deal with, most, with many first-year students 
as the beginnings of, the seeds of, an intermediate module that one can pursue with other accompanying resources. Um, uh, many universities who have had uh, have taught core, uh, notably University of Cape Town, have decided to use the core as the basis of their first year micro and macro course and their second year micro and macro course. Obviously in the second year using the Leibniz options and presumably other stuff. Uh, and the same will be the case at the University of Kerala, where uh, we're told 6,000 students will be studying core uh, shortly. And they're using it for uh, virtually the entire curriculum, including yeah. they're taking the Leibnizes and they're turning that into a math econ course and so on. And I think mm. this is probably more realistic. That, uh, and and as, as I think everybody here knows, the economy is used in a number of uh, postgraduate courses in uh, public policy and I guess others. Uh, so y yes, I think that's a good idea and we should signal that somehow because mm -hmm. somehow looking at this, uh, this 1100 uh, page thing that comes you know, with wheelies on it and so on so you can actually carry it around the airport, I mean, you know, it's like kind of intimidating. And we should, you know, the word curriculum is good. I mean, you know, we chose the word curriculum because it spelt core, but I mean, it really is a whole thing and it, it's a grab bag of stuff that could be done. The problem is people who try to do that think of it as modular. For some reason they think because it's digital it must be modular. And it isn't at all modular, uh, except for the, t the capstones at the end. Uh, so people, they don't have the option of just picking and choosing. They, they really have to go through it and that's what Cape Town is doing. They're doing a fantastic job. And probably okay. also uh, Vitz in Johannesburg. Okay, so maybe we have time for a very quick question. So if we want to stick to there. I, I just wanted to, I appreciate how valuable the teacher notes in going for, forward are. I want to question whether the most important teaching moment to the students is these notes. Because to me, especially first year, the important thing is we have a model, uh -huh. which we used to have. It had standard assumptions. It got blown up by evidence. Now we need these extra theories and we need to test them too. So I wonder if trying to have a single core model of a new standard when we haven't yet debated it is the right way to, to go, as opposed to introducing the students to the fact that there is an ongoing debate, here is how you marshal evidence, and looking at it both ways, including some of the things you, you raised on on that question. And on that, I'll just throw one more thing. And you mentioned two other things that we have to look at sometimes. And one of them is rent control. That most of us who have been deprived of using the standard diagram to show students the standard equilibrium, off equilibrium thing, still rely on rent control. And students came to me from, of all things, Alan Manning's course, where, of course, he abandoned um, the minimum wage to teach it, so he was using rent control. And students not from Britain believe that there are also positive things to look at in the rent control experience. I looked in the empirical literature. It is at least teachable that I still believe in the standard textbook, but it's teachable that we have models. We have strong beliefs in some of them, but we're testing them. I think that's exciting to students also, and it fits with doing economics so very well also. Um, that you could put some of this, like that material, into doing economics and in integrate it so you have this integrated curriculum. Um, thanks very much, Judith. Coincidentally, what Wendy and I were working on two days ago and what we'll be working on tomorrow when we go back to Oxford is exactly an application to rent control of what is actually a fairly standard Marshallian model. Uh, but the, the, the thing that set us off in doing this was reading a very good paper about San Francisco's rent control and the experience of it. Uh, this was widely reported in the press. It said rent control in San Francisco reduces the stock of housing and so on, which was all true. But it also showed, just looking at the triangles and the rectangles and the Marshallian, the consumer surplus lost and gained and so on, that the gains by the renters were huge uh, uh, compared to the losses by the landlords. Uh, and so, yes, there were some triangles lost, but it was a very effective way to, re, uh, to, uh, to redistribute income. And so, that, uh, so even a policy which, like the minimum wage, maybe isn't the best way of helping the poor renters, uh, it's, it's very effective and our tools can show that. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's, I mean, exactly. 
I mean, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with Marshall uh, when it comes to some things, and uh, so we're I mean, we're we're actually going to count the triangles and the rectangles and uh, and so on using the San Francisco data. Marshall also has a very long chapter on or section on why the worker and the employer don't meet on equal terms. That's mm. very much what Robin was explaining mm. with his wonderful Scunthorpe model. So. Okay, thank you very much. I think we already use all the time we had, uh, we need uh, a break. So thanks again to yeah. the speakers.